Job chapter 8. Then answered Bildad, the Shuhite, and said, All right, here's another man, one of Job's friends. And uh, Schofield's note about him is Bildad, the religious dogmatist of a superficial kind, whose dogmatism rests upon tradition and upon proverbial wisdom and approved pious faith or phrase. These abound in all the disclosures. His platitudes are true enough, but there, then everyone knows them, nor do they shed any light on such a problem as Job. So again, we have another man that he speaks right, it's well, we can use it as doctrine, but it's not the case of Job. And many people, maybe out of good intentions, when people suffer, they open up their big mouth and it does no, no better. Matter of fact, it will do more danger, most cases. But how long will thou speak these things? Think about what Job has spoken. How long shall the words of thy mouth be like a strong wind? Hot air. Big puff of air. You're just wasting your voice, Job. I don't think so. Does God pervert judgment? No. Or does the Almighty pervert justice? No. I mean, what do you want God to do? You want Him to be perverted for you? Because your words says, Bill, that you have made God to be a perversion. If thy children have sinned against Him, Job's children are dead by a whirlwind. And he, God, has cast them away for their transgression. No, not according to chapter 1. The devil went up. The devil said, let me at him. And God says, okay, do what you will, but spare Job's life. Don't touch Job. Again, it's the devil doing with God's permission. And as mankind, we always, God always gets the blame. So if thy children have sinned against him, well, they've sinned, and have cast them away for their transgression. They've been cast away because the devil. If thou wouldst seek unto God be time, every time, all the time, any time. And yet, when we read Job chapter 1, he said, you know, he is stewed evil, he's perfect, he's upright, and there's even times that he made offerings for sin for his son. God said he's proper, he, he's well, he's upright, he stews evil. The devil confirmed it. If thou would seek God be time, I think Job does that. I think Bildad does not know what he's talking about. But for the common person, for many a Christian, that's absolutely true. They don't seek God. And make thy supplications to the Almighty. You don't pray to God. We know Job does. And many many Christians, the Bible says in James, we receive not because we ask not. Now, build that is right, doctrine to a point, but not for Job. The Holy Spirit records for us through Job that he does pray. He does make intercession for his family. He is a father, a husband, and a priest. And you can take chapter 8, build that, you can apply it to other people, you can doctrinally apply it to the lost people and to Christians, but you can't apply it to Job. And when we get to Job's testimony of himself, you'll see that to be so, Lord willing. If that were pure and upright, come on, Job chapter 1, Job chapter 1, Verse 1, Holy Spirit writing, There was a man in the land of Oz, whose name was Job, and the man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and shewed evil. Then, uh, now watch this. Okay, that's not good enough. Man wrote the Bible. Chapter 1, verse 8. Now, whoever wrote the book of Job, I think it's Eliphaz, 
They were not in heaven as this is being recorded, Job 1 and 2. And yet the Holy Spirit, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit said, write this down. Job chapter 1, verse 1. Job, you, if you were upright, Job 1, 8. And the Lord said, that's God speaking, unto Satan, has thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in all the earth, a perfect and upright man that feareth God. Go back over here to chapter 8, verse 6. If that were pure and upright. Evidently, Bildad has a complete different opinion than what God and the Holy Spirit. Again, chapter 1 and 2 is not written by a man who went to heaven and saw it. Surely now he would await for thee. You have ever taken God to fall asleep? You're not aware that God is aware of what's going on? Job chapter 2. Uh, Job chapter 2, verse number 3. The Lord said unto Satan, Has thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, perfect and upright, one that fears, there we go still, excuse evil, and still he holdeth fast his integrity. Though thou movest me, what do you mean God's sleeping in Job's life? Satan, you did all that to Job, and still he did not curse you. Or me, excuse me, did not curse me to my face. God is not sleeping. Now the only references you find in the Bible to God sleeping is that period of time during the Great Tribulation period. And he's not sleeping. And he's like in Jesus Christ is waking up. The second advent. So already, we're six verses into the disclosure of Bildad, and as far as Job, he's lied. And make habitation of thy righteousness prosper. Oh, there's a prosperity gospel. There it is right there. See it? Before the law, before the church age, before the birth of Jesus, before the death of Jesus, before the burial of Jesus, before the resurrection of Jesus, there's a you know, if you were to get right with God and be upright, you would be prosperous. Is that not the state in Job chapter 1? It's true. And Job lost it all. And if you love if you love God, you do right, you will be prosperous. Explain to me the life of Paul. On this side of Calvary. Describe to me the lives of Christians in the Fox of Book of Martyrs. Ascribe to me the separatists that lived in New London County of Norwich, Connecticut, that when the Congregational Church took everything they had because they wouldn't hold to that one true state church. Definitely on this side of Calvary. Within the last 200, 300 years. We are not in a prosperity flame of salvation today. The Old Testament is. And that's where men got confused, you know, I'm doing well, I'm doing great. Doesn't that mean I'm right? The Old Testament, yes. Not the new age. Not the new era we're in. Not this side of Calvary. All they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. James, woe unto the witch, rich. Paul writes to Timothy, uh, the, the love of money is the root of all evil. Though thy beginning was small, that's true for everybody. What do you have when you were when you were born? Nothing. You don't even have clothes. You don't even have teeth. You may have hair. Yet thy now watch this prophecy. Yet thy latter end should greatly increase. There's that prosperity. Now we know for Job that's true. We know for many of the righteous Old Testament saints it is true. What do you do with Elijah and Elijah? Elisha had some kind of rented room and he was living with a bunch of uh, uh, sons of the prophets. And he didn't have riches or anything. Yet he was right with God. Elijah was taken away in a world when he didn't have a home. A permanent home. And the Bible records that he showed up with Jesus. 
And the Bible records he keeps coming back in the tribulation period. Moses, what did he have? He had a whole congregation of a church that blamed him for everything, gave him a hard time all the way. He man got mad, he got upset, he didn't have a permanent home, he did not have no gold, he did not have no silver. He shows up with Jesus, and he's coming back in the tribulation period. So riches don't always account to your salvation. On this side of Calvary, you got a man named J.C. Penny. Yes, the department store. The guy was saved. He he gave his employees days off. He didn't make a big deal of it with Chick-fil-A. He donated his money to, to missionaries that went out all over the world preaching the gospel. And God prospered them. And there are missionaries, that, I mean, there are men out there who are rich. And they have tied their entire company's uh, profit. When everybody was paid, all the bills were paid, the employees were paid, whatever was left over, he gave it to missionaries, and we don't know their names, but God does. And on the books, that guy would be poor, that guy would be having nothing. But in the books of heaven, the glory of heaven, we're rich. I'm rich in heaven. I hope. You mean what I hope? I hope I'm doing enough to gain some gold, silver, and precious stone. I believe I am. Verse 8, for inquire, I pray thee, of the former age, and prepare thyself to search of thy father. All right, let's go back and look into the past. A little side note, verse 9, parentheses. For we are but of yesterday, and know nothing, because our days upon the earth are a shadow. That's a little side note from chapter 7. Remember Job said our life is quick, it's a wind, it just passes by. And it's true. And that parenthesis, he said, yeah, our life is short. 80, 90, 100 years, what is that to eternity? You know, once a person is born, he has eternal life, whether it's going to be going to heaven or hell. Think about that. Shall not they, that would be the fathers in verse 8, you look back to the fathers, and tell thee, and other words out of their heart. We went back to the fathers and talked to them. What would they tell us? That would not be good in Jeremiah's time. And Jeremiah speaks about, as we read today, uh, Amos. That would not be a good thing to do then. Because the fathers, the, God spoke to Jeremiah and Amos said, You know, your fathers were wicked and you're just as wicked. So that, that's kind of a general statement, but I'm not going to go back to the fathers of the Haywards. Because as far as I can tell, going back at least three generations, there are no Christians of the Hayward family for me to go back and look. I would not ask my father about godly advice and biblical advice at all. I would not ask my grandpa. I believe they're lost. I believe they've never trusted Christ as their seat. Israel's fathers have gone wicked and gone sour. And this is where the church will get the church fathers. Ask them. They were wicked and vile. Every pope was wicked. Can the rush, now here's some things he throws Can the rush, it's a plant, grow up without mire? I can assume no. Can the flag, that's the first time and last time that word shows up, grow without water? That's a plant in like Egypt, you know, you've seen them in like marsh areas, that's the kind of flag. Imagine everybody making a big deal about the flag and it only shows up once in the Bible and it's a plant. No, without water it dies. You've seen that, you know, where, you know, the water recedes for a long time, you see the plants are dead. While it is yet in his greenness, that's the only time that word shows up, greenness, gotta go green. And not cut down. It withers before any other herd. So, they're frail plants that will just die quickly on their own. Okay. So are the paths of all and forgot God, or forget God. 
Now, the only reference you can take like this, your life is miserable, your, God, your life is dead, it's not, it's short. Like Job said, chapter 7, these plants don't last very long, Job chapter 7, and so are the people that forget God. Does he have the nerve to say Job has forgotten God? Really? Now, what we're going to read 13 to 22 is absolutely correctly true about those who have forgotten God. <coughs> true. But it is not true for Job. Later on, Lord tarries, we're going to come toward the end of the book of Job, and God is going to speak to Job personally. I never had God do that to me or for me. So are the so are the paths of the for, of all that forget God true, and the hypocrites' hope shall perish. Look at chapter six, verse eleven. Chapter six, verse eleven. Job, what is my strength that I should hope? Uh oh, uh oh. Chapter seven, verse six. Job, my days are swifter than the weaver show and are spent without hope. He is directing this to the hope references that Job mentioned. You ain't got no hope, Job? That's because you've forgotten God and you're a hypocrite. And you're going to perish. That is not what you say to someone who's just been stricken. This is the first time Bill Dad spoken, by the way. Job, the note here that Schofield says, Job, you're a hypocrite. For doing what? God said, Satan? Yeah. Have you considered my servant? Yeah. Let me add him. Go for it. What did Job do? Job didn't do nothing. Well, he's got the sin of self-righteous, but we haven't gotten there yet. And we're going to try to take Job as a point of view that we're, we are in chapter 8 right now, not 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. As far as what Bildad knows, Bildad doesn't know nothing. But man, he's slammed the accusation. And Christians do that. I'm so perfect, I can counsel you and tell you what's wrong with you. And you're a liar. And you're the hypocrite. Shut up. God's going to tell them later on, you need to bring Job some uh, an offering because you've sinned. And there are Christians like that. They think they know them and they got to counsel everybody for the wrong. That's a shame. Whose hope shall be cut off. That's what happened, Joe. That's where your hope went. Whose trust shall be a spider's web. That's weak, unstable. Even the wind can kind of, an excessive amount of wind can blow a spider's web havoc. He shall lean upon his house, but it shall not stand. You got a very weak house. Very, it, it's decayed, it's broken, it's not going to hold up. That's true. When a dead man who has not ever trusted Christ, has not ever believed what God told him to do, when he stands at the great white throne judgment, the guy is going to be naked before God, and he's going to have no standing at all. Not Job. The second time around, God says, he's still stewing evil. He's still upright. He's still perfect. <laughs> I guarantee you, if there would have been a chapter two and a half with a conversation with the devil, and God, he's still upright, he's still as true as evil. He shall hold it fast, the house, but it shall not endure. You know, Jesus said something like that. To show you how true 15 is. Jesus said, he that heareth my words and doeth them is like a man that built his house upon a rock. And when the, and the storms came and the weather has come, that house stood strong because it was on a rock. Jesus said, the man that hears my words and doeth them not. It's like a man that built the house on the sand, on the dirt, on the earth. And when the storms came, utter destruction. 
So what Bildad says here is absolutely 100% correct because Jesus gives us the same illustration. Not for Job. He is green before the sun. And his branch, or liken him back to a plant again, his branch shooteth forth in his garden. His roots are wrapped about the heat and seeth the place of the stone. But he's just a green plant, just out there in the middle, just nothing. If he destroy him before his place, then it shall deny him, saying, I have not seen thee. You know, if you die, that's it. No one knows who you are. That's exactly what Job said. When, when you go to the grave, you're not coming home no more. Your house is not going to remember you. So Bildad heard what Job's been saying. And he's answering Job wrong. <laughs> Behold, this is the joy of the way. And out of the earth shall others grow. By the death of someone else. Behold, God will not cast away a perfect man. What did Job 1 and 2 say? How can Job be a hypocrite? And yet, he's perfect by the Holy Spirit. And Bildad closes off this saying here. Because Job's going to answer the next chapter. He said, listen, God will not cast off a perfect man. Uh, I'm going to go over here to Job chapter 1 again. And I'm going to look at Job chapter 1 verse 8. A perfect and upright man. So Bildad, who's called Job a hypocrite, has turned around and backed up Job by what we know what God has said about Job. God will not cast away a perfect man. Neither will he help the evildoer. 100% true. Psalm 711. Uh, God said, God is angry with the wicked every day. Bildad would not say anything as stupid as, God hates the sin and loves the sinner. Neither will he help the evildoers. Is he implying that God's not going to help you? That because everything that's come upon him is because of evil. Again, I don't want to jump ahead, but when we come to the end of the book of Job, God helps Job. What about an evildoer <clears throat> that comes and believes with his heart in the Lord Jesus Christ and gets saved? Repents and gets right, and he, he does right. He battles sin. He's still a sinner, but he repents and he, and he battles sin. God adopts him. But the expression would be here is the evildoers will not ever get right with God. Um, what do you say? Forget God. 13. So are they, so are the past of all that forget God. You know, you never remember God. You don't do anything right with God. Comes all the way down to 21, 20 and 21. Till he, God, fill thy mouth with laughing, and thy lips with rejoicing. So behold, God will not cast away a perfect man, neither will he help the evildoer, till he fill thy mouth with laughing, and thy lips with rejoicing. That would have to go to that perfect man. Because he's not going to do anything for the evil man. That they that, I mean, me, they that hate thee, Job, shall be clothed with shame. And the dwelling place of the wicked shall come to naught. And that's exactly what Job said in 7, 9, 10, and 11. His place will forget him. He's not coming home again. So he's got Job is kind of right with God. But ang angry God is at Job for a vile, wicked sinner he is. And his children die because of their own sin. So God, you know, just throws down lightning bolts at sinners. It's not true. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now, if you don't ever get right and you totally forget God, then you're in trouble. 